Well, good evening. My name is Rose Jansen, and I'm with the Academy of and we are very pleased to be partnering with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you this very special conservation conversation on orangutan conservation research in Malaysia. Uh, many of you are Academy members and friends, but for those of you who are not familiar with us, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are and to mention a couple additional upcoming public science seminars that you might have an interest in attending. The Academy is a local nonprofit. We've been serving the St. Louis community since 1856, so for a very long time. And we have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we do that by offering a very broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the region. You can find more information on us and our community-wide events and programs by visiting the website at Academy of Science, stl.org. You can also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of the literature that I've brought along with me here today. It's outside at the visitor's desk, so feel free to pick up any of that and take that along with you when you leave here tonight. And if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there will be a couple e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. Uh, so, I'm going to mention just a couple upcoming Academy Public Partnership events that you might have an interest in attending tomorrow evening, March 23 at 7 p.m. Science writer, best-selling author, and featured speaker Rebecca Sklute is at the Missouri History Museum as part of a new economics series, Class, The Great Divide. She's going to be talking about her New York Times best-selling debut book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which tells the story of Henrietta, whom scientists know as Hala. Her cells were taken without her knowledge, and they became one of the most important tools in medicine. They were the first immortal human cells grown in culture. They are still alive today, though Henrietta has been dead for nearly 60 years. Uh, HALA cells were vital for developing the polio vaccine, uncovered secrets of cancer, viruses, and the effects of the atom bomb helped to lead to important advances like in vitro fertilization, cloning, and gene mapping, and have been bought and sold by the billions. Uh, there are actually two options for tomorrow evening at 4 p.m. in Graham Chapel at Washington University. Rebecca Sklute will be speaking. Uh, the event is uh, free. That event is also free and open to the public. I don't have information on parking, but I believe you may be able to find out more by visiting the university's website uh, at education.wustl.edu slash events. Um, if you decide to attend tomorrow's talk at the History Museum, you might want to plan to arrive early. They are expecting upwards of 500 plus. So while the event is free and open to the public, you will need to pick up a seat voucher. And vouchers are available at the museum starting at 5.30 p.m. and the doors will open at 6.30 p.m. And again, there's information on tomorrow night's talk at the History Museum on both our website and the Missouri History Museum's website. Uh, Monday, March 28, 10 a.m. at the Center of Clayton. Uh, as part of our On Science series with Oasis St. Louis, Dr. Frank Flynn, adjunct professor of religious studies and arts and sciences at Washington University, talks about Darwin and religion, conflict versus resolution. You do need to register for this event, uh, and you can do so by calling 533-8586. That's a 314 area code, or you may visit our website. On Tuesday evening, March 29 at 7.30, here at the zoo in the Living World Auditorium is another conservation conversation. We have Paul Nelson, who is the Ecology and Land Management Planner with the U.S. Forest Service. He'll be talking about patch burn grazing and whether or not it's right for Missouri's remaining high-quality prairies. On Thursday evening, March 31st, Rocky Kolb, the author Holly Compton Distinguished Service Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago, speaks about the mysteries of the dark universe at Washington University's McDonald Center for the Space Sciences at 7 p.m. in Whitaker Hall, room 100. This event is also free and open to the public, but you do need to call for a parking permit, or you may email T-R-E-C-I-A at physics.wustl.edu. The phone number to call is 314-935-5332. There are a couple flyers about this outside on the visitor's desk, and if you pick up one of those flyers, I think you can actually use that as your parking permit. I don't have too many of those. Uh, you can find, again, more information on these and additional upcoming science opportunities on our website or in the literature we've left for you to take with you today before you leave. And with that said, 
Uh, I'm going to let Mike Riddle, who is with the Zoo's Education Department, uh, talk to you next. Hi, I'm Mike Riddle, and I'm representing Louise Bradshaw, our Director of Education tonight. And uh, she couldn't be here. She's at an AZA conference, but uh, she asked me to stand in and welcome everyone here. Welcome Dr. Eric Miller. We appreciate you coming, sir, and everybody else. Welcome to another evening of Conservation Conversations. Try saying that 10 times fast. Tonight's is about orangutans. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Stephanie Braccini to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Braccini is the zoological manager of our Jungle of the Apes, or as we uh, know her around here, the Ape Whisperer. Dr. Braccini. Thank you, Mike. Um, last May, I had the opportunity to travel to Borneo and Sumatra to firsthand take a look at the palm oil crisis, see orangutans in the wild, and meet with various NGOs, organizations, villagers, um, kind of get, see what was going on on the ground. The Kinabatangan Orangutan Conservation Programs was one of those NGOs. They are overseen by Hutan, which was founded in 1996 to develop and implement innovative and creative solutions to conserve the orangutan populations of Sabah, Malaysia. Their passion, enthusiasm, and drive were beyond impressive. Um, enough so that when I got back, the great ape staff here at the St. Louis Zoo decided to donate our proceeds from the Primate Awareness Weekend and our Primate Picasso's event to KOCP. They were established together with the Sabah Wildlife Department and have upwards of 40 local community employees, which educate, um, carry out research, and patrol as honorary wildlife wardens. It was through their research that it was revealed that orangutans are able to live and thrive in secondary logged forest, as opposed to the primary unlogged forest that we originally thought was their prime habitat. Hutan also works to educate local villagers, palm oil plantations, and other agencies about the importance of rainforest and their inhabitants. By replanting areas of orangutan habitat, they're reestablishing corridors for wildlife to safely travel within the confines of the Lower Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary. In addition, Hutan employs those honorary wildlife wardens to patrol and monitor orangutan and elephant populations and aid with the numerous human-animal conflicts. Please join me in welcoming the representative from Hutan, Haji. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Hajinder, but everyone calls me Haji. And we're just a small group, so please feel free to just put up your hands and ask questions while I prattle on up here. Um, I'm very lucky to be working with Hutan. I'm also from Sabah, but I'm not from that area where we do our work. And I have the easy job. I just go there and I see what's going on. I don't do the hard work they do. And I come here and I get to talk to you guys. So we'll start with the PowerPoint. So we're known as um, Hutan, and unlike a lot of uh, orangutan NGOs, our logo is slightly different. We use a gecko, and that's because uh, that one was taken from the neighboring state of Sarawak. I'm sure some of you have heard of the Pinan people, and uh, they, they hold it in great reverence for the forest, so we use that. Kinabatangan describes the floodplain that we work in, and well, we started out with orangutans, but it turned into much, much more than that. And the logo for the up there is the Wildlife Department of Sabah, which we work very closely with. So where is Sabah? First question. So just use Google, wonderful Google Earth, and that's where we're at B, and Sabah is down there at A. It's actually the dog's head, if you could see that, of the, of the island of Borneo. And that is Malaysia's second biggest state. The biggest one is further south. And of course, the biggest chunk of Borneo is Indonesia, Kalimantan. And the smallest country on Borneo is Brunei, which once owned the whole Borneo. But now they're really tiny. And we're based right down there on the East Coast. And with Sabah, a lot of wildlife that we have that survives today, it exists on the East Coast. And there's two reasons for this, uh, lack of human populations, and also that a lot of it were Muslim populations. 
And m the Muslim people do not eat exotic meat, so they don't hunt orangutan or other monkeys. Occasionally, some of them hunt uh, deer, but it's very rare. And the community we work in, they're called the Orang Sungai, just like orangutan means uh, man of the forest or person of the forest. Orang Sungai means person of the river, Sungai's river. So I love this picture. This is what it looked like once upon a time before there was any logging. So this picture was actually taken uh, by Martin and Osa Johnson, who happen to have a museum in Kansas City. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been there or heard of that. You yeah? have? Okay. <laughs> um, I would love to go see that because they have amazing pictures and they also have aerial, aerial photography of the area. And that is beautiful. That's just a beautiful forest. I, 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 I just cannot imagine what it was like. Fortunately, today, this is what we see. Uh, the forest on both sides of the river is secondary. It's quite fragmented. And then further down there, it's actually palm oil. Um, Sabah is the number one producer of Malaysian palm oil. It's a very important industry for the state, for the country. Uh, the taxes from palm oil pay all the government servants in the state. And uh, this area of the Kinabatangan is very high in yield, three times more yield with palm oil than any other area. So big competition, wildlife, palm oil. Logging already finished, so trees are too degraded now. This picture again illustrates the problem with fragmentation and, um, well, our forest. You see down here is a, a palm oil but it's very not uniformed, it's, it looks kind of messy, and these are actually done by smallholders, and we never go after smallholders or say anything to them because they are literally people trying to make a better life for themselves. And then you see some patches of forest, but if you see back there, the further end, how that's very uniformed, that's actually palm oil by oil palm company, so you can see the difference. Small scale, big scale, and when they go big, they go really big. Uh, today, 1.4 million hectares of Sabah is under palm oil. That's almost 20% of the state. Yet, these guys are all over the place. Where we have uh, so much forest used to become palm oil, or we have isolated or defragmented forests, or even just not good types of forests. But we keep finding these guys. So we're very, very lucky. And this is what our work is about. It's, uh, sorry, that went really fast for some reason. It's, it's, about, it's about all the wildlife and, of course, community as well. I mean, they both have to benefit each other. If wildlife was not benefiting the local community, well, then they will say there's no point for the wildlife. A uh, brief overview of orangutans. Uh, so we know there's about 7,000 individuals in Sumatra, two subspecies. There's <coughs> about 41 individuals in Borneo, three subspecies. So my next slide, oh wait, just before I go to that. In Sabah, we have 11,000 orangutans. And 60% of these outside protected areas. So basically, they're in secondary forests. In Sarawak, the neighboring state, there's about 2,000 individuals, um, and so they say 100% are in protected areas. We're all very doubtful about the numbers for that state. Even though it's a Malaysian state, uh, information is very hard to get. Just to illustrate that example, the chief minister of that state has been in power since 1981. He's 75 years old and is planning to run for re-election this April. So the, you kind of get that it's hard to work there. So that means Sabah is the stronghold for the Malaysian orangutan population. And in Sabah, people are really keen about wildlife. They might not see it, they might not have met it, but we always talk about it and we're always like rather protective. Don't take our orangutans, don't take our elephants. So this map shows you better the different subspecies, this tree in Borneo. And the reason I added this map here is because the subspecies we have, the mori, which is the green one, we find that they seem to adapt well to secondary forests. They seem to be doing okay there. We have recorded in our study site more than 300 species of bark, fruit, 
they, they're eating well. The large flange males, some of them, they don't even get up till, well, usually the orangutan will wake up in the morning, uh, start foraging, forage the whole day, and then make a new nest or go back to an old nest at, at night, all between 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But in our forest, we sometimes find that the large flange male wakes up at noon, forages a little bit, and 3 p.m., he's back to bed. So they seem to be doing quite okay. So we've been there 13 years. Of course, we, well, sometimes the staff do lay down and look at the orangutans because can you imagine, there you are looking up all the time, gives you quite a creak in the neck. And we do time budgets, so it's like we'll see what they're doing every three minutes, what the activity is, and it's like foraging, playing. Now, there is still major problems. And habitat loss is the, the biggest one. And this picture actually shows plantation. So this is being opened up for plantation. And these are the type of problems we're dealing with today. Uh, a palm oil company will say that's, that's a nice big forest you have there. And that's really nothing. So where do the orangutans go? And this is another problem that we, we find. Um, and I'll show you an example of how we have, we've addressed this a bit later. But what you have here is protected forest in front by the river. And then somebody had land to open a plantation at the back. So now with oil palm, you need to drain it. So that's a drain that they put in. Unfortunately, with orangutans, they don't like to go over water. So now you have two populations already there separated by this drain. It's also the same with elephants. They, it depends on the size of these drains, but most of them are really big. Even if they're empty, they're too steep. So. Again, it cuts off elephant populations as well. Yeah, the habitat's not good. I mean, I don't like the forest in the Kinabatangan. The wildlife is fantastic. The people are fantastic. But the forest, oh, it's really hot. I mean, the tropics is hot, but this forest is really hot. So, as I said, we don't have the best of forest. And again, back to the whole landscape. That's all palm oil. And we really have to address this issue with the palm oil industry. We have to work with them because they're not going to go away. And if they did go away, what would happen is that there'll be only whatever is remaining in the forest to exploit. So now if palm oil is no longer being sold or bought or planted, and we have timber remaining here and there, unfortunately wildlife lives within those forests, it will be taken down, it will be gone. So palm oil is here to stay. Situation today, this is the, again the state of Sarawak, uh, sorry, the state of Sabah, my state. And it's a bit confusing because each state has their own definitions of different types of forests. So this map is very colorful. But basically, 50% of our landmass is under forest cover. The palm oil industry did try a long time ago to include themselves as forest cover. Thank God they were unsuccessful. Only 15% is totally protected. Mostly it's because we don't consider commercial forest as protected. Certain departments do, but we don't. This gives you an overview of the number of orangutans and where they are. So in national parks, we have about 2000, uh, sorry, 250. And then protected forests, and then you have different classes, about 2800. And then the Kinabatangan, which is LKWS, we have about 1,100, 1,000. So we say in the total protected areas is 4,150. See, and then the biggest chunk is actually in commercial forests. So this is why we say 60% of the orangutan are outside protected areas. So we have about 11,000 orangutans. 
This is going back to the Kinabatangan. It's an amazing place for wildlife and tourists flock over there because it's really easy. You get on a boat, you go down the river, you see a lot of bird species, you happen to see, you will definitely see the proboscis monkey, you will be lucky if you see the orangutan, but most people do get to see them. Elephants, some people don't get to see them. Stephanie didn't get to see them, unfortunately. So the, the yellow bit is the wildlife sanctuary. And I mean, looking at it, one would wonder, why is this a wildlife sanctuary and it's not one contiguous piece of land? And that's because it took a long time to get it gazetted. So it was proposed in 1984. It was finally gazetted in 2005. And by that time, a lot of people had taken out pieces of land. This land is actually village land, but all this is already palm oil. So we end up with a very fragmented area. And next slide will illustrate a little bit more of the problems with this. We're going to have localized extinction in certain certain lots of the wildlife sanctuary within the next 50 to 100 years. And that's because they are too fragmented out there and the, the number of orangutans there is not viable for long-term survival. So there's only two choices. Either we move them out, but it's not like we have a lot of land other places. The harder choice and what we want to do and what the sanctuary is there for is to link it back up. So we're talking about doing corridors, we're doing, talking about doing forest patches, just things to help wildlife along. Because uh, orangutans do come down to the ground to walk from one place to another when there is no trees. It's unfortunate, but they have to do it. And once you have land protected for orangutans, it also helps other species, talking about the sun bear, which is the world's smallest sun bear, and you have it here too, I think. And then uh, elephants, of course, uh, Proboscis monkeys are mostly by the river, but if you start planting by the river, that helps them as well. So this is our problem. So we've looked at different things and the different things we can do. So with plantations, land acquisition and restoration, both are extremely expensive. Land prices in Sabah and even in, in the towns to buy a house, to buy any piece of land, it's extremely high and the reason for this is palm oil money. So a lot of people who have made a lot of money in palm oil, we have palm oil millionaires by the way, they invest in um, property. So it makes it, as I was telling Stephanie, impossible for someone like myself to buy property today. I could never own a house now. And um, so land acquisition is very difficult because the property prices are ridiculously high. Uh, yet we're still doing this, uh, Hutan along with other partners and working with the Sabah government actually. We try to get funding to buy certain pieces of land, especially where we know it's really going to make a difference. It's not much left, but we're still doing that. Restoration is so pricey and the thing is to push for the palm oil companies to do it themselves, but it's really difficult. So. While the population genetically on one side of the big river and the other side are different, the populations that are cut off by, well, along the tributaries or cut off by the drains and stuff like that, they are the same. And previously when we had primary forests, they had the big trees, they would just go across. But now they can't. So we make orangutan rope bridges, and I'll show you an example of that. The drains are a problem. So it's either you remove them, which is, also very expensive because you need to fill it up again, drain it, and, or you put bridges. So we've tried that as well. Actually, WWF did a couple of, they call them elephant bridges. They put culverts on it, and they found the elephants were using it. Road, we try to get rid of them if it's within the sanctuary because then we know people, usually from the plantation or people coming from the other side of Sabah, from where I'm from, from the, from the capital to go hunting. And again, same thing with the river reserve encroachment, and there's a lot of that. So this is very time consuming and expensive. But well, the orangutans have the opportunity to contribute to the development of the state, and the state government realizes this. So wildlife is, is good for them, and they realize it. So we have uh, our chief minister and the minister of tourism, culture, and environment. They're all for stuff like this which is great. 
Because if you have the government support, things do move. They might not move as fast as you want, but they do move, and they move in the positive direction. So well, we're still worried because the orangutan is a slow breeder. Having said that, we also find that we've, the orangutan baby birth intervals are getting shorter in the study site. So sometimes we find a female with, with a young baby and then another one that's maybe five years old, six years old. These are positive things, but we still worry because of the current situation of the land. So we want landscape approaches. We want, we want the palm oil to get really involved. And it's through things like, hopefully through things like the round table for sustainable palm oil that they will be forced to do this. As Will was saying, everybody needs to join the efforts. Right, back to an example I wanted to share with you guys was the orangutan bridges. So, noticing that the populations were fragmented by the small tributaries, uh, in 2005 we decided to do rope bridges across. And it was just a simple rope bridge, one going that side and one coming back. And I mean, of course, you see in zoos, in rehabilitation centers, orangutans seem to have no problem using little bridges and ropes. They seem to be doing pretty good. We, however, could not find evidence of the orangutans using it. We found everybody else using it. It was like a highway or something. The squirrels were using it. All the macaques were using it. The proboscis monkeys were using it. We're like, where are the orangutans? So some people said they saw, but we didn't have photographic evidence. We did put um, camera traps, but all we got were macaques. And also our camera traps had a lot of problems with humidity. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, and by this time we had built really fancy bridges using uh, fire hoses that humans could cross. Finally, a tour guide, a local tour guide, caught a picture of an orangutan using the rope bridges. So this was great news. Finally, we have proof, reason to continue on with this. Funny thing was, he used the first most simple one. So all that fancy stuff and, huh. So that's an example of something that works. Uh, something else that we do is uh, the Sabah Wildlife Department ha is in charge of an enactment that came into force in 1997. And this is unique to this, the state that I'm from. And it gives them the right to empower people that they choose who would have to take a test first to become wildlife wardens. So this gives them the power to conduct search and seizure and this has helped a lot because the wildlife department is not a very rich department in manpower. So by being able to have um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, even palm oil companies and other landowners have this, it's, it's helped to, calm, calm, what, to curb the illegal hunting that's going on in the area. So for us, we have four full-time staff who are doing this and then pretty much almost everybody else is a wildlife warden. And what we do is they go and up river, down river, they go by roads, and of course they do it at a very random rate. And they, f they check out for illegal logging, for hunters, but more than anything during the festival seasons, you know, like when we have public holidays, we set up roadblocks because we find a lot of people coming from the west coast to go hunting. Then we have the Elephant Conservation Unit. I have to tell you a little bit about how locals in that area feel about elephants. Um, in the 1980s, massive scale of palm oil conversion started. Up to that point, local villages would see or hear the, orang uh, sorry, the elephants maybe once a year. And that's usually when the elephants are going one side of the river, well, going up or going down. So they respected the elephants. And in their language, they call them nenek, which means grandmother. And it's a term of respect. But what happened was, now with new land being opened up and with no planning of how they did it, the elephants were coming closer and closer to the community. First of all, they were a little bit scared of the elephants. The Bornean elephant is actually very small compared to the, even the mainland Asian elephants. And when I say small, I, I don't mean that small, but you know, smallish, as tall as Stephanie and things. And so, but still, they're, they're scared of, of naturally, I mean, scared of the elephant. But the other problem was the elephant was coming into their orchards, taking their fruit, and also uh, 
some of the elephants seem to particularly like this one graveyard and that really bothered the local community because they really respect their dead and suddenly the elephants are going there and messing up with the tombstones a little bit. So from going from a place where they respected the elephant, they went to a place where they didn't like the elephants, they're pest, and they wanted, you know, they wanted the government to get rid of them and to deal with it and just take them away, put them somewhere else, you know. And actually up to 1992, the wildlife department's way of dealing with human elephant conflict was to cull the elephants. So by 1992, they had culled 300 elephants, but it was the department itself that realized this was no way to address the problem and they stopped. <laughs> So, when Hutan started in 98, they were doing orangutan work, but they got more and more involved with the local community and started dealing with problems that it saw. So, in 2002, they established the Elephant Conservation Unit. And basically, these elephants, they're not like the African elephants, as far as I understand. They are very easy to frighten off. And this is actually just a metal cannon, and they put carbide, and it makes a loud boom. Elephants go away. Uh, actually, you could even just clap your hands and they get scared, especially at night because they don't see very well or you flash a torchlight. And they're quite easy to disperse. They're very gentle. So the Elephant Conservation Unit, the point of them was to help the local community. So we did a study before the, we started the unit and we checked on how much damage local communities faced with elephants and it was quite high. And then as soon as we started, the rates went down. So the ECU still continues its work, mostly with local community. They do help out the big plantations, but it's more like, okay, we'll come and show you what we do, and then you have to do it yourself because you're a big company, you have the money. But with local communities, we give them loans to put up electric fences, and the electric fences are quite safe because I've been zapped by them a number of times and I'm still alive. But it just gives them enough of a fright to back off. So they work very well. And that's a picture of a palm tree that's been ripped up by an elephant. And as I said, we can get very close to the elephants. <laughs> and that's a prime example. Fendi here, he's actually trying to put his hand up his butt a little bit because they're sensitive at the back. I mean, I haven't tried that myself. I don't plan to. And this is Sulaiman, he heads the Elephant Conservation Unit. And I wish he was here to speak today because he speaks about it so passionately that people start crying. And uh, he was very afraid of elephants to begin with, but he really liked them. And I mean, he's from that community and he always said that he always wanted to work with elephants, but he was really scared. And then he started working with Hutan and now he's up there close to the elephants. We are also doing, um, we have, we're very lucky now because we have two PhD students working with us. Uh, one is Malaysian and we don't have many Malaysians studying wildlife at that level. Our society is still very much into, you know, be a doctor, lawyer, engineer type thing and what, you want to work with wildlife? Is something wrong with you? You know, parents are like not happy with the idea at all. But things are slowly changing and Farina is, is great. She's, she's one of those people who's taken that step and is very enthusiastic about it. I was sharing with Stephanie that when the, um, she's a student under Cardiff University and when the professor, Dr. Benoit Goussens, called for students to come for a casting call really to see how many people he could get, she was the only one who turned up. So it's sad, but that's how it is back home at the moment. So Farina is looking at their behavior because everything that we think we know about them, we assume it's the same as the mainland elephant, mainland Asian, sorry, elephant. And it's all assumption. So now they have identified which elephant is which and usually we identify them by all their injuries and cuts and bruises and all that. And then they also do uh, genetic studies by taking their feces to see who's related to who and how they act. So hopefully we'll know more about them. Another thing to mention about this elephants is we know that they are a separate subspecies. But the thinking now is that this, it's actually the extinct Javan elephant. 
that was at one point taken from Java to southern Philippines area of Mindanao, where they don't have elephants there anymore. But um, the older people remember elephants. And then from there, they were taken to the east coast of Sabah. So now they roam on the east coast of Sabah, going down a little bit to Indonesia and Kalimantan and back up. And the population is less than 2,000. Their biggest problem is fragmentation and uh, where they go. Excuse me. Environmental awareness. I mean, I come to the States and this is my second time to the States and I'm always so impressed with how much zoos are doing for stuff like this. Environmental education is, is amazing here. And I like how it started for us as well because it was the local staff who said, we need to do environmental education for rural communities. Because in Sabah, we do have a lot of environmental education, but they're all in urban areas. And it's not for the communities that live next to the wildlife. So we started doing this um, directly with the community in, along the Kinabatangan River. There's a lot of small villages. And mostly we do it with primary school, kindergarten kids, and we have a lot of different type of fun stuff for them to do. So there's some pictures. And we celebrate World Environment Day every year in, in June. This is, this is a story I would like to think of as a success. And we call it Fishermen for Conservation because that first picture up there, it shows uh, these are prawn traps and uh, they, they use the bark of the trees to make these traps. And what the fishermen have to do is, once the area was gazetted, and before it was gazetted as a wildlife sanctuary, it was still protected as a bird sanctuary. They have to walk into the forest, they have to find the right kind of tree, they have to strip the bark, they damage the tree, it takes them a long time, they have to walk really deep in the forest. And then it takes them a week to make the, the trap, and then it lasts for six months, and then they have to start again. So lots of damage happening there. And so the wildlife wardens really had a problem with this. And what they did was they sat down with some of the older fishermen, and they tried to come up with a solution. So they decided what they could do was come up with a different type of trap. And so they tried a lot of different methods. So that they tried like using uh, wire mesh, uh, different type of coverings and finally the one that worked very well was just plastic wire. It was easy to make, it takes half a day and since we've been, been using them uh, in 2005, we haven't had to replace even one. So some people like to tell us, but that's wrong, you're, putting, you're throwing plastic in the river, but we're not throwing it away, we're using it. And the fishermen, they, they tend to say that the amount of fish they get from it is a lot, uh, sorry, the amount of prawns they get from it is more than before. And the best part is that they don't have to go into the forest, cut the trees, and you know, the trees are pretty degraded as it is. So this was a good story. This is the hard story. You think studying orangutans is hard? These ladies, they really have the toughest jobs. It's not easy to do reforestation. We do it on a very small scale. Uh, that's because we want to make sure that the trees survive. So what happens is that we have um, small plots of land. We use electric fences, so that adds to the cost of it. And we put up the electric fences to just stop wildlife from coming in and stamping over the, the trees as they grow. Then we have four full-time stuff, and this is alternative li livelihood. Um, some of these ladies are single moms. And what they do is they have to do weeding mostly with machetes. So that's really hard work. Um, places that are further away from where we know the orangutans are, they use weed whackers, but mostly they just use machete. And then they, they have to clear the undergrowth, they have to grow the trees, and we, we plant a lot of, well, we plant all native trees. And we know the ones that we know that orangutans use. And then they have to keep doing this every day, go from one side to the other side. And I mean, I could not do it. I, I don't know how many people could do it. And the thing is, we tried before with guys. It did not work very well. 
It was the ladies who did such a good job. So they're amazing. Right, I want to show you a PowerPoint because, uh, sorry, I already showed you the PowerPoint. I want to show you a video because I can see some people are snoozing already. And uh, hopefully that will give you a good overview and then we, it'll be great if we could talk about things because I haven't talked a lot, a lot about palm oil. I can talk a lot more. It's my favorite subject after all. That, that, that guy who sings that song, he actually lives in Sabah, so if you want to hear him live, please come down. <laughs> Advertisement for Amir Yusuf there. I'm just going to get the slideshow running. And it would be great if you guys have some questions. Yeah, okay, we're done. No. <laughs> Yep. Stuko, yes. Oh yes, it's a very nice long name. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and 
We argued for a long time what map to use at the back of that brochure and we decided to go for that big one. This is, uh, wait, I'll get my arrow out as well. So the part that looks like a dog's head and you can see the dog's ears and its mouth and it's facing that way, that's the state of Sabah. And it used to be known as North Borneo Chartered Company because it was run as a company from 19, sorry, from 1888 till after World War II and then the company went bankrupt because of the war. Then it became a British protectorate and then it was the name, the original name of Sabah came back. And then the Sukau is the village that we're based in. And the village is located along the Kinabatangan River, Kinabatangan. And uh, the legend of the name is that it means Kina means China, which means Chinese, and Datang means come. And the reason is that there's records of uh, Chinese junks coming up that big river. And the reason they came was for bird's nests. There are some caves out there that have really good quality bird's nests. I take their word for it. I really don't want to eat bird's nests. And um, this is actually a source of good income for the wildlife department today because it's still a thriving economy. And we are actually now started a project with local community to revive some bird nest production in some caves that have been plundered by people who do not practice it sustainably. So we have localized extinction of certain swiftlet species. And that's a new project that we've started up and actually that's in your brochure. Is that clear? Okay. This is Borneo, this whole, that big old island is the third largest island in the world. And this is Sumatra. It's not really on your map, I think, Sumatra. It is? Okay. Kuala Lumpur is Peninsula, Malaysia. That's next to Sumatra. Yeah. It's on the map? Okay. So. Uh, Indonesia is bigger than that. It's not all on this map because the big island of Java is all down here. Let me go back to a bigger map. It is a Malaysian state. Malaysia was formed in 1963 with um, Peninsula Malaya, Sabah, Sarawak, and Singapore joining together to form a country called Malaysia. Singapore was kicked out in 1965, which was very good for them actually because it turned out they're much healthier, better without Malaysia. And Indonesia is this big island of Sumatra, this island of Jawa, Sulawesi, part of this island. And Indonesia has 3,000 islands. It's the biggest Muslim country in the world. It has a lot of wildlife. It also has a lot of human beings. And uh, the problems with palm oil is more urgent today in Indonesia, especially in Kalimantan, which is on Borneo, and in Sumatra, where the orangutans are as well. Yes? Yep. Uh, what's your assessment okay. of what is and what can be their, their role? Okay. I should uh, make it very clear that the story I'm telling you today is the story for the state of Sabah in Malaysia. And the story for the state of Sarawak in Malaysia is different. And the story for the, what is in Kalimantan, Kalimantan has three different territories, is different. And the story for what is in Sumatra is different. The story for Sabah is positive. And the reason it's positive today is because 20 years ago, all the bad things happened. Nobody was around to really see it. I mean, there were people around to see it, but couldn't really make noise about it. Um, starting from the 1970s, the state government in Sabah kicked out all foreign researchers, especially those doing work with wildlife, because they were busy plundering the forest. 
So now it's very easy for the state of Sabah and the government of Sabah to be the good boys. And actually there's a National Geographic article, uh, I think it was October <coughs> two years ago, and it was talking about how things are so positive in Sabah, and it's true. I mean, we have direct lines with the Minister of Tourism, who's also the Minister of Culture and Environment, and he's actually a very good guy. And the Sabah government is very much for pushing environment. And actually, there was going to be a plan to build for us our first coal-fired power plant, which was only 300 megawatts, but so many of us were against it, that the state government rejected it two times. And then the federal government, just like, say, your president here, decided to go ahead for it, but then we kept fighting it, and then it was also defeated in the end, so now we're safe from having a coal-fired power plant. But that is what's happening in Sabah. What's happening in Indonesia is different, and then they, I would, I would, be, I would follow the assessment that it's difficult with the government, that NGOs are trying their best, but they keep having to fight the tide with the government. For Sabah, the story is easier. All the bad stuff's done. We can be good guys now. Now it's more about fixing things by having corridors, by having patches of forest, by working with palm oil companies. Uh, as of January this year, the Chief Minister of Sabah announced no more opening of new land for palm oil. It's not that difficult for him to say that because there's no more land. <laughs> so it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's easy to be the good guys now. So the story in Sabah, very positive. It's quite easy to work with the government. It's quite easy to contact the government. Sarawak, I said, is a black hole. I mean, you know there's something wrong when somebody's in power long, well, not as long as Gaddafi, but quite, quite long. I mean, 1981, he came into power. And just recently, he married a 29-year-old Syrian. So it's, it's a lot of funny things going on over there. They also have a corridor of renewable energy, and under renewable energy in Sarawak, they classified coal as renewable energy. <laughs> they also have one of the biggest dams. So there's a lot of things going on with Sarawak, and the indigenous groups in Sarawak, if they don't develop their forest, it gets taken away from them. So there's local communities that are forced to plant oil palm at least they can reap the monetary benefits from oil palm. Yep? Was there a potential of people tourism to play the part of oil palm? Can't even compete. Sabah does very well with tourism, and our tourism revenue is quite high. Our tourism arrivals are very good. They can't even compete with the money from palm oil. It's just massive. It's so massive that our second biggest money note is uh, 50 ringgit. And at the back of it, it used to show the oil and gas industry. And two years ago, they produced a new note. And at the back of it, they show palm oil. That's how powerful the palm oil industry is. And I mean, I always thought it was stupid. Why plant one plant? What if there's one disease? What are we going to do then? But it does very well. There's a lot of. Uh, R&D and involved as well, sorry. No, no. Everything, everything from the simple cooking oil, which is subsidized in Malaysia actually, to chocolate cookies, toothpaste, shampoo, everything, it's everywhere. Uh, there is debate whether it's palm oil is a good thing or a bad thing as a product itself. The readings that I've done, it seems to point very much to it being very healthy and very good for you. I mean, it's trans fat free. Orangutans actually quite like to eat it. They like to eat the, the fruits. Um, our research assistants, they always say that the orangutans, they know that go across and eat the palm fruits seem to have nicer, shinier, healthier looking hair. And, um, uh, there was another place that I used to work, with, work in in Sabah, which is also a wildlife reserve, uh, but it's a commercial forest as well. And it's like an island. It's almost twice the size of Singapore, but it's like an island because it's surrounded by palm oil. Yet, it's an excellent place to see wildlife because at night, they're going over to the palm oil restaurant 
And then you'll see a sun bear, and I've seen a sun bear sitting up in the palm oil tree, munching away, having a great time. Palm civets, clouded leopards, orangutans, everybody loves palm oil. Not just producers of all these products. Uh, wildlife actually quite like it too. But they can't survive on it, of course. And we have found that, um, unfortunately, male orangutans seem to have the need to disperse still. And this is where it's a problem. We have found evidence of them going through plantations. And when you have vast amount of plantations like that, I mean, it's so easy to get lost. And it's a total lucky draw whether you get to another forest or you're just going to die. And I mean, things decompose there very fast. So it's very hard to find uh, dead uh, carcasses of wildlife. And you could survive. I mean, it'd be like asking you to eat a carrot for the rest of your, your, your life. I mean, you couldn't survive on the long term. You could survive while you're moving. So this is, again, why we need to work with them. And it's not easy working with them to do corridors and patches of forest. Yes? Oh, I'll, I'll go back to it. It's, see, the thing is, it's really expensive. So we've done, oh, actually, I should go to that slide as well. Oh, never mind. I'll just talk about it. What we've done is we've worked with other NGOs and the state government to get money to buy some pieces of land. Um, and this land is usually put under a multitude of different people's names, so it's quite safe. And then uh, it's, but that's really difficult to do. And there's not many opportunities for it right now, but still we're doing that. And the other thing is to replant back the forest, like to take, take parts of the river. Like, I mean, this, is, this looks like it's very short distance, but it's quite far. So actually, the idea of a corridor is very expensive as well and very difficult to do. That's why we also talk about patches of forest. So imagine if you're an orangutan, and then you're like, OK, I have to go that way. I'm going to go that way. I go up on a tree, and I see, OK, palm, palm, palm. Ooh, I see a bunch of trees over there. So OK, I come back down, and I head that direction. So we feel that that could help them move on to another forest. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry? The, the state maintains the right, but it's very complicated. Because one good thing about the state of Sabah is that it went full steam ahead for, OK, we want to be very environmentally protected. Like, what, what happened is different agencies have different leeway. So let me explain it to you this way. There was incidences with sand dredging, because now with all this palm oil money and all this development in towns and building of houses and malls. We love shopping malls, by the way. We're full of it. And you need sand. And you need river sand to do all this building. So this was an issue. So they started taking the sand from the river. And then we had the different departments involved. We had drainage and irrigation. And they said, OK, we can only get involved if they're taking the sand from this side of the river, like closer to the river. And then it depends how wide the river is. So they could take the sand from the middle of the river if it's deep enough or wide enough. And then it overlaps with another enactment, which comes under another department. And then they said, no, it's OK if they do it on that side of the river. So it got very complicated. But again, it was the Minister of Tourism who came in. And he was like, this is not right. We cannot have sand dredging in this area. But of course, we complained a lot about it as well. And so in the end, they banned sand dredging along this river because of all the wildlife which was, again, very positive. Having said that, they're still doing the sand dredging in other parts of Sabah, and it's just going on. Yeah, sorry. Is there a single product that palm oil uh, has substitutes for, or all those the products? I th well, I think they've substituted a lot of products if they're in pretty much everything that's produced from cookies to toothpaste to shampoos. 
I don't know what that is. Um, I do know that uh, in New Zealand last year, Cadbury was going to substitute, I think it was milk with palm oil. I'm not too sure, that, I think it was milk. And uh, a lot of people were very upset with that. I was upset because I happened to think Cadbury from New Zealand tastes very nice and I didn't want a slight change in taste. So they backtracked on that. But I think it substitutes a multitude of different things. Sorry. Oh, biofuel, oh, dirty word. Biofuel is a very dirty word. Um, we don't want them to use it as an excuse to plant more. I mean, then you're like, you're saying that something is green and you're using it for, for running engines and stuff like that, but it's not really green. Because it's again taking out of, from a food source uh, and needs more land because you need more for biofuel. So we're, we're not very happy with biofuel. Sorry, there was, yeah. There's different people doing stuff like that. Uh, the Royal Society um, from UK does a lot of work in a place called Denham Valley. And recently, this is a very interesting article. I just read about it in the newspaper, actually. I haven't had a chance to talk to them. They're looking once again at plantations on a big scale. And this is different because they're looking at it as being biodiversity rich. There's been a lot of studies, and I have to say, this is fueled by the Malaysian Palm Oil Council, which is a propaganda body. They get a lot of money from all the, everybody in the palm oil industry has to pay a percentage of their income to the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. And the Malaysian Palm Oil Board is not bad because what they do is improve management and yield and they put money into research. But they, everybody else has to give money to the Malaysian Palm Oil Council. And these guys are propaganda, pure and simple. So they love to do studies that say there's a lot of biodiversity in plantations. And that means you have 30 species of beetles maybe and six species of rat. And I mean, it's not really true. Nothing compares to even a secondary forest. But there is a lot of studies being done. For me, the interesting thing is that the Royal Society is now looking at it in a different way. And I kind of trust those guys, so I'm very interested to see what they're doing. And uh, if you want, um, just contact me and I'll get you more information on that. Sorry, you have to hand up so long. I'm glad you asked me that question. That's very interesting. <coughs> uh, excuse me. I'm, I went to the round table for sustainable palm oil, the third year meeting. Every year they have a meeting at the end of the year. And at that time they had it in Singapore, which I thought was rather odd. And at that point it was kind of NGO driven. So the person who really does all the work and pushes RSPO is the Secretary General. And he came from an NGO background. Palm oil people didn't really like him. They considered him a bit of a hippie. You know, he kind of had long hair and he did come from an NGO background. He was, he was really good though, uh, his name was Andrew here. And what he did was he stepped away, he said fine, we'll find somebody else. And the palm oil industry put their person in. And <clears throat> I won't mention his name because I'm not very fond of him and I think he did a really crappy job. So when I went to RSPO number three, I was quite hopeful. I said okay, this looks like a solution. They're gonna fix the problem. I can tell people that, you know, just make sure you buy RSPO stuff. When I went to number five, I was beginning to get doubtful. When I went to number eight, I had totally given up on RSPO. And I said, that's it, sorry, not eight, seven. I don't trust them. I think the way to go would be for individual companies to work with individual companies. So like, if you're Nestle, you work with whatever palm oil company and you go down to the ground, you make sure they're doing the right thing. But recently, last year, they, they got rid of him and they had an interim person, and then now they have their permanent person. And I happen to know this person, and I think he's the right person, because he used to work with WWF, and then he left to work uh, on the sustainable side for palm oil industry. His name is Daryl Weber, and he just became the Secretary General starting January 1st, but it's just not him, he has a new team, and 
think when I check their website, they have five or six different new people. So I'm expecting a lot more from RSPO. And I'm going to be catching up with Daryl hopefully before May because there's going to be a conference in London about this. And I think that conference is going to be very good. So I'm looking back to RSPO now. I'm trusting them. They have already come out with uh, certified palm oil uh, since 2008. Problem was when they came out with it, the buyers were not buying it because it sold at a premium. So WWF came out with a scorecard and then people were like, oh my God, we're not on the scorecard. Okay, then they started buying it. Having said that, there's still not enough certified palm oil. Having said that, there are other issues that I'm still worried about. Like there's also something like carbon credits, which means that if I buy green palm, I can still do my dirty stuff, you know? So there's a lot of questions I still have, but I, I have hope in RSPO again. No, because uh, the other ones didn't have, it's just performance. It's performance. I'm really hoping things will turn around this time because I think they've got the right person because he knows how to talk to industry. He knows how to talk to NGOs. What I think would be really good is to see more non-governmental organization from the US joining RSPO as associate members so they have a voice, including zoos. I think that would be really, really good because the more, more people join, the more noise you can make. And the other thing is, um, the last one I went to, number seven, I was surprised that there were people from South America and Africa. So they're also coming into palm oil in a big way. And the interesting thing was at that one, the contentious issue for the industry was carbon, carbon emissions. Of course, the NGOs wanted carbon emissions to be included as part of a criteria. The Malaysians and the Indonesians said, no way, Jose. At the end of it, the South Americans and Africans who were there got together and said, we'll do it. And I was really glad and I'm very happy if people buy their palm oil if it's sustainable, it's better. I mean, that'll teach the Malaysians and Indonesians a lesson. Um, the Malaysians are definitely the richest and most powerful companies are based in Malaysia. So that's a worry for me as a Malaysian because most of the time, over the years, and this is really is thanks to the Malaysian Palm Oil Council, Malaysians are very defensive about palm oil. It's become an East versus West thing. It's like, how dare you Westerners tell us what to do? And, you know, Malaysians defend palm oil. They believe what the message that's been sent out there. A lot of Malaysians even think palm oil originated from Malaysia. So these are things that we have to tackle. It's a bit difficult. And the, because the Malaysian Palm Oil Council has spent a lot of time, a lot of money, they, they have their own minister in actuality. Uh, there's a federal minister called the Minister of Plantations and Commodities. Sorry. Yeah. Especially as a It's difficult. It's difficult. Ah, I wish I had a clear answer. I wish the answer was palm oil is bad. Don't buy palm oil. That's it. You know, problem solved, easy message done, but it's not. And so what I've been telling people previously, especially in Western countries is that you have to push the, the, the bias like Nestle and all that to make sure that they are looking at buying sustainable palm oil. Is it sustainable? Can I trust RSPO's certifications? I wish I could just say yes, but it's a complicated issue. I'm still not sure. I cannot say to you, that's the way to go. It's the best we have at the moment. That's as good as it gets at the moment. But things have to improve. Having said that, the industry, the palm oil industry has done quite a bit to try to get themselves sustainable. I can't believe I'm defending them again. Uh, <laughs> I really don't like working with the palm oil industry personally because I've been, it's, this is the best way to describe them. You explain and you explain to them why you need the wildlife, why they need to leave maybe 500 met meters by the riverbank. But all they see is like, but I can produce so much more if I take that. But the thing is pressure from the West, especially Europe, has pushed them in such a way that they're feeling that they have to be green. 
they have to do the right thing. They're always trying to make it easier for themselves. Like say, for example, you go to RSP and you say, all right, these are the 10 things that you have to do. And they're like, okay, can we just do three? You know? But uh, Europe has really put a lot of pressure on Malaysia and Indonesia. I, I personally want to see Malaysians put a lot more effort. But having said that, again, it's a question of money. You know, when MPOC has so much money to spend on propaganda and say we don't, how do you get the message across? And I'm sorry, I don't have easy answers. I wish I did. I hope I will. Yes. So you mean like, um, say for example, Nestle right. using it. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, people like Nestle, and Unilever is actually part of a group that, that formed RSPO, so they're, they're very committed to it as well. Not that I'm advertising for any company. Uh, what is easier to do today is to go to the RSPO website and see which companies are producing certified palm oil it's not as easy to find which companies are buying it. There is the WWF scorecard, which is quite British-based, European-based, so they will give you ratings. So the other easy thing to do is to go to their website and search palm oil scorecards and then see which companies are rated higher. But I know big companies like Nestle, Unilever, they've all set a deadline for themselves to be, uh, to to use, say, sustainable palm oil by 2015, 50% of it, stuff like that. Yes? Well, this is a very good question. Yes, no, this is a very good question. And this is what I mean, like, there are things with RSPO that I'm not very happy with yet. Because uh, when they came up with what will be sustainable. And like I said, you know, NGOs say 10 things, industry says we'll do three. So it's like different, different categories. And at the moment, they have things like the carbon credit bit, which is, they call it green palm. So it's like, I continue doing my dirty work, my dirty stuff, but I will buy green palm. So I'm buying from another company, I'm buying the credits from another company that's doing it well. And then I can put that logo and say, I'm sustainable. This is, this is good palm oil. Another thing is that they might use some that's sustainable, some that's not, mix it together and say it's sustainable. See, there's this different, different criteria. And personally, I need to go back to RSPO. I need to talk to Daryl. I need to ask him, what's going on? How are you going to address these issues? People need to know. But at the same time, I still think it's a good message to send out to companies to say you have to look for and buy the certified palm oil because it costs more and then you're sending a message immediately to industry. I'm willing to pay more for the good stuff. And that is a good message to send to industry. I'm going to buy or I'm going to support Nestle or Cadbury or whoever because they buy that. They're higher on the WWF scorecard. I don't have any simple answers for you, I'm sorry. How do you grow? Oh, how do you grow? There's ways to grow sustainably. Uh, there are companies in, uh, in Sabah right now. It's, called, it's under a group called Wilma. And what they do is they made sure they kept forest aside that was not cut down. They also wanted to fix their mistakes. So they've gone to the rivers that they have identified as, they, actually, first of all, they've hired zoologists and biologists. And then they identified certain rivers and they replanted it with forest. So that's steps in the positive way. And then there's also the way they run their mills. It's particular standards. It's, it's like best management practices. But for us, the major thing is that they do not cut down land in environmentally or wildlife sensitive areas. And this is more of a problem today in Indonesia than it is in Malaysia. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. That's right. 
that's, yeah, no, that's exactly right. Stephanie visited them. So they, they have, besides the tree planting, they, they run their mills on steam. They, they set aside 30% of their land. What was the other one? I can't remember. And there's no recycling. Yes, that's right. And then, so one yeah. tree has, has yielded its maximum at 35 years? About 30 years. They will remove that tree and they will not recycle it. They will not touch any area or start any recycling. But that's in sensitive areas, though. So there's other, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have sustainable practices that are as far as I know. Yes. A very high percentage for us in Sabah. The, it's mostly Malaysian owned. They, I mean, there are companies that are Dutch based or New Britain, and I cannot remember where it is based. But mostly the the profits stay within Malaysia. It's made the country very very rich actually, more than petroleum. Uh, in Sabah, the issue for us is that the money is going back to Peninsula Malaysia. And we don't like that, which is why the government puts a big tax on it. So how many people have I managed to confuse tonight? <laughs> I'm always confused about this issue. To be quite frank, uh, two years ago we decided because Hutan is very small. And to be quite frank, WWF in Malaysia is very big and they should be stepping up and doing this, but they're not. Uh, we decided not to deal with this issue. So we stepped away from RSPO after that number seven. And now, just before I came to the States, this thing with Daryl happened that he, he became the president, uh, sorry, the secretary general. So we're looking back at RSPO. And then of course, sure enough, as soon as I came here, everybody's asking about palm oil again. And I'm like, oh, Mark, we have to look at this issue again. So, uh, Right now, at the back of your brochures, you have a website addressed to us. Our new website, which I have to finish when I get home, will have a section on palm oil. But you have an email address there. Send me any questions. I will definitely get you the best answers I can get. They might not be the easy to understand answers, but I'll be honest. I won't lie to you guys. Yes? They're good, actually. Actually, no, the sun bear, not so good. Uh, we don't know how many sun bears we have. We have a sun bear rehabilitation center that's being set up right now, being built right now. It's next to the orangutan rehabilitation center in Sendakan. And uh, I don't know if you know Wong Siu Ti. He's, he's the one who's running that. We don't know the population. We, we do know that they need help because unfortunately, the sun bear is still being killed for its gallbladder, even in Sabah. You can still find places in markets that people sell this. The clouded leopard seems to be doing pretty much better. There's gonna be a carnivore symposium in Sabah in the middle of July, sorry, in the end of June. And uh, what they have found, uh, the group of people who are doing the research on, on carnivores, we have about 25 species, including the, the clouded leopard, which is the Sunda clouded leopard, so it's endemic. And we keep finding evidence of them with camera traps. They seem to be doing very well in disturbed forests, which is what we keep finding with most of our wildlife in Sabah. It's just incredible. Uh, not palm oil, but secondary forests. Though they always visit the palm oil plantations for their desserts. <laughs> so. Is there anything else? Producers wanted it. It was cheap, it was good. Apparently really good, really easy to use for so many different things. And uh, that caused the explosion and plus the fact in Sabah and like in the Kinabatang and the yields are very high. The other thing about palm oil is they plant it on a 30 year cycle. So in Peninsula Malaysia, they've been doing it for a very long time and a lot of plantations are into their third cycle. 
So now they're spending a lot of money on research and development because they find that it's a monoculture. They, they go on the second cycle, their yields are dropping a little bit. They go on to the third cycle, the yields are dropping again some more. So they're spending a lot of money on research to try to increase that. But in Sabah, it came in pretty much in the 80s, and then they were immediately finding, wow, they grow so fast, they're doing so well, their yields are so good. That's why Sabah's the number one producer of Malaysian palm oil. We produce more than Peninsula Malaysia. Well, not the whole Peninsula Malaysia combined, but we're the biggest producing state. Um, the other worry is the state of Sarawak, the one next door, the one with the chief minister from 1981. They have um, established as an institute to promote the planting of palm oil on peatland, which we all think is a very bad idea. And that's because they have a lot of peatland. And again, it was very easy for us to say in Sabah, we're not going to palm, uh, plant palm on peat soil because we have very little peat soil. So we just pretend it was like, because we're the good guys. We won't plant there. There's very little land anyway. But uh, this is a problem because in Kalimantan as well, they're trying to promote this idea, planting on peat soil. And that's very bad. Yes? Why? Oh, sorry. Because of carbon. It's like carbon. The, and it's also like uh, whenever we have, um, when they open up new, new plantations, especially in Indonesia, uh, they burn. And this just burns. And then they plant again, and it's bad for uh, the, the amount of, of oxygen that's sunk back into the ground. It's very bad. So it's a big worry for Indonesia. Again, I worry more for Indonesia than for Malaysia. And the other thing is guilt, because a lot of these companies going in there are Malaysians. They're also going into Papua. They're going to the Solomon Islands. They're taking the palm oil back to Africa. They go to countries like Liberia, looking at Cameroon recently. So I worry about the forest. And uh, yeah, a good solution would be to have a, a balance against the Malaysian Palm Oil Council and to have them working in Malaysia to educate the people there. Yeah. Anything else? Um, using sickles mostly, uh, sorry I don't, didn't put pictures of the plantation, but the palm oil tree grows kind of like a little bit higher than, well, if Stephanie stood up and put it, it's, it's about, yeah, about that high. And <clears throat> so the palm oil fruit bunches up on the top and that's what they want. And they use a sickle, a long sickle and they pull it down. Malaysia <coughs> has another problem because uh, we use cheap labor from Indonesia and the Philippines, mostly from Indonesia, to harvest all this palm. And now that Indonesia is opening plantations at a massive scale, um, a lot of workers are going back because they can make equally good enough money there in their own countries. So now Malaysia is looking at importing workers from places like Bangladesh and Indochina for our slave labor, really. Working in plantations is not pretty. That's another thing about RSPO that actually has helped. It's how human beings are treated in plantations. That also is another thing to look at. Having said that, the smallholders who, even staff who work with KOCP, with Hutan, a lot of them have their own little palm oil plantations. And that's a different story. So we always separate the two, the big companies and the smallholders. Different story. Wow, we've just been talking about palm. Any questions about elephant stories? They're really cool. We can get quite close to the elephants because they're very gentle. They're not like uh, the mainland Asian elephants or what they have in Sumatra or the Africans. But no, 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 no takers. <laughs> Any other questions? Sun bear stories, oh, okay, my sun bear stories is like seeing sun bears eating palm oil and eating rubbish at an eco lodge. That's my sun bear stories. Usually the, the other stories that I hear about sun bears are always really sad because it's always, all right, found another sun bear in a market, 
went after his gallbladder. So yes, that, that one still happens quite a bit, unfortunately. People are more aware about the elephants and orangutans. Having said that, we still find dead elephants in Kinabatangan, and that is because of conflicts with plantations. Usually they're shot. But generally speaking, if you go to the towns, people are like, oh yeah, oh, we're so cool, we have elephants, and we have orangutans, and they love it. But most people don't meet those, those elephants and orangutans. Yes? It's a Chinese thing, I don't get it either. It's like the rhino horn as well. Yeah, then they dry it and it's for medicinal purposes. It's just like the rhino horn as well. We also have the Sumatran rhino in Sabah. It's on the brink of extinction. We don't know whether we have 30, we have 40, we have 50, maybe 60. And um, this is a good example about palm oil company as well, actually, going back to them. Uh, they paid for a semi-captive breeding enclosure in the wild. Uh, the palm oil industry, well, a palm oil company paid $7 million to the Sabah Wildlife Department so they could build this enclosure. It's really nice of them, isn't it? That same week they gave the seven million, they cut down 25,000 hectares in Sarawak for palm oil, of apparently very nice forest. So what do you do? Wildlife departments don't put their money. Yes. From Java. Yeah, they, were. they definitely were at one time domesticated because um, there was a lot of little sultanates, you know, little kings here and there. And it looks like the, they were gifts from Java to Holo, which is the southern Philippines, Mindanao area. And from interviews with the older people there, they know that the elephants were definitely there at one time. And we're not very far from there. And from genetic studies, we know that the population comes from a very small group of founders. So it looks like they were brought into eastern Sabah at one point a couple of hundred years ago. And uh, they're actually probably not part of the forest on a long-term scale. People just don't remember stories not passed on down. But it's interesting. I mean, it's like uh, conservation in a zoo. You know, a species that's already gone extinct, it's there. But uh, people in Sabah are very proud of the elephants, so they won't, they'll probably won't be happy about it. Call them the Bonio pygmy elephant. But uh, yeah, it's no scientific reason for that word pygmy. It makes people think that they're small, they're not. I don't have any pictures of the rhino, I'm sorry, uh, because we're not directly involved with that project. I do have pictures that, that I have, but I don't have it right now with me. And uh, this, I can tell you about the, the captive breeding started, uh, the project for this started two years ago because this rhino wandered out of a protected area. Actually, it was an area that they had no clue that the rhino was still there. And he wandered into a plantation. Now the last time that happened, a, a rhino was found, all we found was the body and that was in 2003 because they were like, hey rhino, horn, hmm, good, chop, big horn. And again, it shows that things are changing in Sabah because the plantation worker didn't do that. Instead, he called his boss and the boss called the wildlife department. So that's quite a positive thing. Previously, I'm sure five years before they would have it would have thought about doing other things with the rhino. It's totally protected under law. Or, I mean, you, you, it's mandatory jail sentence if you found to have hurt a rhino. So it's, it's positive that people call the wildlife department instead of killing it. So now we have that rhino and the uh, incredible story about this rhino is that he wandered out, he had his little hurt foot. Wildlife department came, WWF came, and they took care of this rhino for a week uh, because they wanted to kind of habituate it before they moved it to that other reserve. And all they had to do was like, here, here you go, here you go, okay, jump. And he went in the kitchen. <laughs> he was very quickly habituated, apparently. He's like a big dog now, I don't know. 
it's incredible. So our problem right now is finding another rhino. <laughs> so he can breed, we, we, the, the semen study has been done to check whether he's viable and he is. Problem is the only other captive rhino we have is a female who's quite old and blind in one eye. And so she was moved from the zoo to his enclosure and they're just hoping for a miracle. Highly doubtful that she'll be able to breed. She's had previous um, miscarriages and cyst, which is apparently very common with rhinos. It's not very easy to breed these fellas. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Uh, even with the orangutans uh, in the Kinabatangan area, they're not scared of humans at all. It doesn't mean they go down and greet you, but they don't, well, some of them won't like you and they will, they will start making noise and they go away. But on the whole, mostly the orangutans are quite okay with humans because they haven't been hunted there. So they're very comfortable. We do have some orangutans on the west coast of Sabah up in the mountains, but they, They've been hunted quite a lot, so they're really within the protected park boundaries, and they're very secretive, and they're very hard to find. And they're quite high. They're about 2,000 2, meters high. Yes? Do you have any poisonous reptiles? Poisonous reptiles? Oh, yes, lots. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, I don't know a lot about them. I think Mark could talk more about them. I think they're beautiful. See them occasionally. Oh, snake. Okay, bye. <laughs> so, that's kind of my reaction, really. No, but they, they are beautiful. Frogs are awesome. They, we have a lot of tree frogs, all of them. Actually, the frogs? Sorry, say again. How are the frogs? That's an interesting question, and we want to know the answer as well, because uh, say, for example, in the Kinabatangan area where we are, the only study that was done previously was a two-week study by a local university, and they recorded a certain amount of frog species. So now it's been three years that we started doing our own frog um, species hunt. And the number of frogs that we are recording, and I cannot remember off the top of my head how much we have now, but we're still going up like this. We still haven't plateaued yet. So it's, it's very interesting. We, we don't know really. We hope they're doing better than we thought. Yeah, they, were they definitely were at one time domesticated because um, there was a lot of little sultanates, you know, little kings here and there. And it looks like the, they were gifts from Java to Holo, which is the southern Philippines, Mindanao area. And from interviews with the older people there, they know that the elephants were definitely there at one time. And we're not very far from there. And from genetic studies, we know that the population comes from a very small group of founders. So it looks like they were brought into Eastern Sabah at one point a couple of hundred years ago. And uh, they're actually probably not part of the forest on a long-term scale. People just don't remember. The story's not passed on down. But it's interesting. I mean, it's like uh, conservation in a zoo. No, a species that's already...